Hello, everyone. Welcome. You know, everybody's just getting uh, into the meeting. So we'll wait uh, just a couple minutes here. I'll keep my eye on the numbers, the attendees. Uh, when it looks like we've got the majority of people joined in, then we'll get started. Welcome everybody. Hello to welcome to today's webinar, Food as Medicine, a three-part community series focused on living well and preventing type 2 diabetes through nutrition, cooking, and physical activity. I'm glad you're able to join us for our second session in this series, um, which is focused on nutrition for wellness. My name is Rebecca and I'm an employee at Comagine Health. And we work to improve health and create a better healthcare system so that people and communities will flourish. Tonight's event is made possible through the partnership and support of Get Healthy Utah, the Utah Diabetes Coalition, the Steering Committee for the Prevention of Diabetes, and Comagine Health. The presentations you'll hear this evening are brought to you by Bear River Health Department, Summit County Health Department, and Utah State University Extension. Before we get going, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you'll know how to participate and have the best experience possible. You can listen to this webinar using your computer speakers or call in by phone. Using your computer speakers or headset is recommended for the best quality. At the bottom of your screen, you should see three buttons. To the far left is audio settings. In the middle, you'll see the Q&A. Clicking the audio settings will bring up the audio preferences for the webinar, and you can send a sound check to your speakers and microphone. But be sure your computer's volume is turned up, and while hearing from today's presenters, your microphone will remain muted. After the presentations are over, we will move into a time of Q&A. However, at any point during the webinar, you can submit questions in the Q&A box. To do this, click the Q&A button and a window will appear where you may submit your question. You can submit questions anonymously or to the whole group, and you can keep this window open to view the questions from other participants as well. If you see someone's already submitted a similar question, you can vote on their question by clicking the thumbs up button so that we can focus on the most popular questions first. There are a lot of people joining us tonight and I'm sure there will be lots of great questions. We'll send a follow-up email with responses to some of the questions we're not able to cover during the time we have. If you're having any technical difficulties, we have moderators who can help you via the chat, um, via the Q&A box or through chat. Today's webinar will be recorded and the slides, and re uh, the slides will be sent to you in a follow-up email and a recording will be posted on the Comagine Health YouTube channel. Um, the link will be provided in, a, in approximately two weeks when we send out that follow-up email. So now that we've covered the housekeeping items, I'd like to share more about our event tonight. So the purpose of this three-part series um, is really to bring some awareness. And, oh, sorry, I might have just covered up your slide here. There we go. One second here. I got myself backwards on my slides. So tonight's uh, event is to um, bring some awareness to prediabetes and diabetes and share some realistic steps that you can take to live well through nutrition, cooking, and physical activity. And in each session, we share a principle of healthy living, an introduction to an evidence-based lifestyle program, and we have a live cooking demonstration. And through those presentations, we aim to share what can be done to lower the risk of developing type two diabetes and other chronic diseases, as well as share tips for living well with diabetes and to have a little fun along the way. So for tonight's session, we have some great presentations for you. We have Pam Chapman, who will talk to us about a nutrition, about nutrition for wellness. That's our principle of healthy living. Pam is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist. She's worked in her field for over 20 years and has been with the Bear River Health Department for the past four and a half years. She's a lifestyle coach and master trainer for the National Diabetes Prevention Program. Pam has a passion for helping people make changes that can last a lifetime and helping people live an active and healthy lifestyle. And then we'll hear about diabetes self-management education from Serene Brooks. 
Serena is a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes care and education specialist. She currently works for the Summit County Health Department, where she's the coordinator and educator for their diabetes prevention program and the diabetes self-management education program. Serene has a special interest in diabetes work, having two of her children with type one diabetes. And then we'll have a live cooking demonstration by Catherine and Paige from Utah State University Extension. Catherine Hansen is an Extension Assistant Professor in Grand County in the Home and Community Department. She loves spending time with her family, golf, water skiing, and trying new recipes. Paige Ray is an Extension Assistant Professor in San Juan County in the Home and Community Department. She loves spending time outdoors and making a difference in her community. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Pam to start us off in presentations. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, you're a little on the quiet side, but we can hear you. All right, I'll try and talk just a little bit louder. Is that okay, better? that's perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for that great introduction, Rebecca. We're, tonight, we're going to talk about what is on your plate. This is a easy, simple way to plan your meals, plan your what you're going to have for dinner, what you're going to have for lunch. Um, simple to follow while being able to control your blood sugar. Um, one of my favorite things about this diabetes plate method is that nearly everyone can follow it. This just isn't for the person that might live in the home that has diabetes, this can be followed by children, this can be followed by husbands, wives, grandparents, um, and it's so easy to use. Um, so we're going to go to the next slide. And we're going to start with kind of the first thing we want to do is divide our plate um, half on one side and then the, um, split the other two so we have three sections. That first section is we're going to fill our plate with non-starchy vegetables. I also like to call these your salad vegetables. It's kind of an easier way to remember. These are the vegetables that generally don't have a big effect in our blood sugars. They're high in fiber, they fill us up. They also make the plate look nice and full. No one wants to have an empty lonely plate when they're looking down, um, getting ready to eat. We get lots of vitamins and minerals from these foods um, and we have lots of flexibility. So if we look at the next slide, we can see what are some examples of these non-starchy vegetables. Um, you've got asparagus and broccoli and cauliflower. Maybe you love eggplant this time of year, maybe baked in the oven. Um, this could be in the summer with your summer squashes like those ever-growing zucchini that we have here in Utah that like to grow really large. Um, lots of choices. Keep in mind that it doesn't just have to be fresh vegetables. You could also use canned vegetables. You can use frozen vegetables. Just you wanna have half that plate being these non-starchy vegetables. Then we move on to step two. And this is where we're gonna put a quarter of our plate being our lean proteins. Now, a lot of people are familiar with those protein foods because it tends to be what we hear in the news about you know, high protein diets. Um, but we, we don't necessarily wanna have just protein, um, but we wanna make sure we're including it with each meal. Protein also generally doesn't raise our blood sugars um, super important to help us feel full. And not only that, it's very important with immunity. We know that this time of year, we have a lot of bugs going around, not just COVID, but we have the flu um, and other just things that like to creep up on us these winter time, you know, as it gets colder. Um, so the next slide, here's our protein foods. Your, your chicken, your turkey, your eggs, fish, lean beef, lean pork. Now notice I'm saying lean. So when you're at the store looking more for that 90 to 93% lean ground beef, um, lean pork, um, cheeses. Um, if you choose not to have meat, you can have tofu, um, nuts and nut butter are great choices. And if you'll notice on this list, is this is where we have our beans and lentils. Beans and lentils are kind of a duo food, um, great source of fiber, great source of protein, but they also have carbohydrates. So we're gonna cover them in just a minute. Um, but this is a list of those protein foods that you want to take up about a quarter of your plate. Um, for some people, that might be about the size of the palm of their hand. Um, about a four ounce serving is kind of what we're looking for. So that's step one and two. So let's move on to step three. Here's those carbohydrate foods. Here's the other quarter of your plate. Now, I think personally that carbohydrate foods tend to get have a bad reputation. Um, We've heard, oh, avoid carbs, carbs are bad, don't have rice, don't have pasta. Of course, we can have those foods, but we just need a moderate 
amounts, keeping it to about a quarter of your plate. Now, these have the largest effect on our blood sugars. Carbohydrates naturally turn to sugar when we digest them and they raise our blood sugar. We do need them for energy, but we're just gonna watch the amount that we have. So on our next slide is where we get the choices of carbohydrates, and it's a very big list. This is your breads, your cereal, your pasta, your rice, your corn, and yes, potatoes are here, and so are corn. Uh, a lot of us might have grown up thinking corn was more of a vegetable, but it's actually really um, a starchy food. Um, our fruit, um, maybe it's a crisp apple that you had from your yard, um, milk, sweets, ice cream, um, and if you'll notice, beans and lentils are right there on this list. Um, beans and lentils are carbohydrates, like I just mentioned before, and also a source of protein, so we get to kind of balance them in two different sides. Also notice that your winter squashes are on this list, like your butternut squash, your acorn squash. Um, those are yum, very good when we roast them or we mash them, um, kind of popular at a lot of holiday meals, so keep in mind that they fit into this carbohydrate side. So let's look at the next step. Next slide. Step four, this is we gotta have something to drink with our meal. We don't wanna be thirsty. And we wanna choose a low calorie or water. Low calorie drinks don't raise our blood sugars. Um, they're no fuss. Um, usually just something, you know, to kind of make us stay hydrated. So the next slide is gonna have some good examples of what this might be. Water, unsweetened coffee, unsweetened tea, you might have some hot peppermint tea. Um, water flavored, maybe you like to use lime or some fruit in your waters, diet sodas, sparkling water, all good choices um, of having something to drink without raising your blood sugars. But what about breakfast? I get this question a lot. You know, it's a little bit harder to have breakfast, have half your plate being those non-starchy vegetables. I get that. We might not be in the mood for a salad the first thing in the morning. Um, but the suggestion really is to just have two of the groups um, with your breakfast, not just having one. Uh, maybe you have some eggs and some toast or a piece of toast with a piece of fruit. Um, just having a little bit of more than one category with your meals is one way to have breakfast. Um, Next suggestion would be, what about our combination foods? You know, what about things like your casseroles or your soups? You know, if you have a hot soup this time of year, staying warm, we all know we might be getting some snow. Um, they say, you know, might be just a theory, but we might be getting some snow on Thursday. Um, my a hot bowl of soup might be nice, but how does that fit into the plate method? Well, you have to use your imagination a little. You got to picture in your head, what would this meal look like if I were to put it on a plate? Well, the, if I pulled the noodles out of my soup, Okay, that would be the, my carbohydrate source. If I had some beans or some meat in the soup, okay. But you know what, maybe I'm missing a salad to fill up as those non-starchy vegetables. This is what you have to do is just use that imagination and maybe add in that salad. Next slide. And lastly, I just want something to think about is that we realize that not all of our plates will look the same. If you went on Google right now and you Google diabetes plate method, you might see the generic method of just a traditional salad with a piece of grilled chicken and a baked potato. Well, we know we all don't eat that way. So if we look at the next slide, we can see that um, all ethnicities can have their own version of the plate. Um, these are just some examples. We have Hispanic foods. We have some beans and tortillas there as our carbohydrate source. Uh, we have some fish. Um, with a salad as the non-starchy vegetables. Similar with Asian foods, um, we've got some mushrooms and some different kinds of greens there with rice um, and some fish. Next slide. And here we have Arabic foods and Native American foods. These are more traditional, but what, maybe it's a kebab with a roll and some rice and some more traditional vegetables for Arabic foods. And very similar when you get to the Native American food. So keep in mind, this is a very flexible way to eat, but it kind of helps plan out your meals a little bit. And the last slide. So this is just a reminder and a review of what this looks like. Those non-starchy vegetables on half your plate, a quarter of your plate being your protein foods, a quarter of your plate being your carbohydrate foods, and then a non-zero calorie drink, just so you stay hydrated.
And we're going to pass it on to Serene. Thanks, Pam. Um, I love the plate method as well. Um, it's it's a great way to incorporate all your favorite foods, the things that you like, and get them in the right portions and then have a real balanced meal. So I love that. So our next portion is we're going to talk about diabetes self-management education. And during this part, I'm going to refer to it as DSME for short. And um, we're going to talk, um, if you can go to the next slide, we're going to talk about what it is and when a person should participate in it and why they should participate in it. So what is diabetes self-management education? This is the ongoing process of providing knowledge and skills for diabetes self-care. And it's a great opportunity to learn skills and be able to incorporate them into your everyday life. And I love, the thing I love about DSME is it is so individualized and it's, it's based on um, the needs and the life experiences of the individual person. And it helps support those decision-making self-care behaviors. And you notice how this says problem solving. Um, those of you who have diabetes, um, you know that it requires a lot of problem solving. Um, it can be different day after day, um, one day to the next. And so being able to have that problem solving skill is a really important part of it. And um, it can be a one-on-one -on -one session or it may be a group session. DSME can be delivered either way. But it will be led by a diabetes educator who is specialized in diabetes management. And that educator is going to allow you to make decisions and be able to set your own goals that will help make a positive impact on your diabetes self-management. Um, DSME is also a co collaboration with a healthcare team. And it's really an important part of DSME, that collaboration, because when you have healthcare professionals that work together, you see improved clinical outcomes, you see improved health status and improved quality of life. And participating in DSME has shown to bring all of these things. Now, when you are going to have DSME, your primary care provider will send a referral to a diabetes educator, and this will allow them to communicate back and forth with each other. The educator can see um, a little bit more about you and some of the things that your physician is helping you work on so that the educator can support that. And then after your visit, the educator can then um, communicate back with your provider and talk about the things that were discussed during your education session and maybe um, notify them of the goals you're setting for yourself so that they can kind of understand what you're working towards as well. Uh, another important part of the healthcare team is your pharmacist. The pharmacist will understand how medications work together, um, how to help you learn more about what the medications are doing. I think that's a really important part too, is understand what those medications that you're taking are doing for you. And so that it makes sense why you're taking them. Um, they'll help you learn when to take them and maybe be able to communicate back with the physician if they have other suggestions of how the medications maybe could possibly work better together. Um, they can also collaborate with the educator. So the educator can help explain to you what the medications are doing. and it's really important to be your own advocate in this situation. So if you go to an educator, make sure you ask if they are collaborating with the physician or with the pharmacist or anybody else who might be on your healthcare team. Um, Cause it's, this is a really important piece of the DSME process. So when should somebody participate in DSME? There's some key times that are really important. The first one would be at diagnosis. So a person gets diagnosed with diabetes, they go into the physician and they, they get their um, either medication or insulin, whatever it is they need. Um, but that isn't the, necessarily the best time for the education to take place. The role of the physician is to help with the diagnosis and help get your treatment set up. 
the next step would be to meet with a diabetes educator and get some better in-depth education. So the educator may explain more about diabetes and go over some basic things that will help you get started on your path for self-management. Another really important time would be at your annual assessment. So if you have diabetes, it's important to see your physician every six months or at least once a year. And um, that yearly visit is a great time to also get an appointment with your diabetes educator and, and participate in another DSME session. This gives you a chance to go over how your year is going, um, any things that have come up during that year regarding your diabetes, maybe medication changes, anything at all answer questions. And um, it's always surprising what you might learn at a, at a visit, even though you've maybe had diabetes for years, there's lots to still learn because there's always changes. Another important time would be when there's new complicating factors. And so if you have something come up that is impacting your diabetes, a, a visit, a DSME visit would be a really great thing for you to have. And that way you can talk to someone about those um, complications and, and decide the best way to work through them so you can have the best management of your blood sugars. And then always if there's a transition of care. So if you've been admitted to the hospital due to your diabetes and you're coming back home, maybe you've changed physicians, um, all those times would be an important time to go see your diabetes educator. Now, having DSME is not limited to these four times. Really, you can go as often as you feel that you need to. And one thing to really remember about DSME, it's not only about the education you're receiving, but it's also about the support that you're going to get in helping you through those ups and downs of diabetes. So why should a person with diabetes participate in DSME? Um, some of the things we've talked about were, you know, helping improve your life's your life and your health. And one of those things is an improved A1C level. Now the A1C is a, a common test done to, to kind of determine where your blood glucose levels have been. And an A1C test is an average of your blood glucose levels over three months time. So it's kind of that big picture of where your blood sugar levels have been. And um, if you can see an improved improvement in those A1C levels, you know that on average, your blood sugar levels have been a little bit lower. So we, that's a really important part of managing your diabetes is seeing what those labs are showing. And um, we know that diabetes, having diabetes isn't necessarily the cause of um, having problems with your health. It's the long-term um, high blood sugar levels. So we want to see those A1C levels go down. There's also, um, it's shown to have improved control of blood pressure and cholesterol levels. So it's really important to have those numbers in a normal range if you have diabetes. And then higher rate of proper medication use is also one of the important parts of DSME. Because remember, we talked about that collaboration with your healthcare team, and that um, helps with that proper medication use. Um, another, another reason why is there's fewer or less severe diabetes related complications. And that is because your blood sugar levels will tend to be lower. And that's when we see fewer complications. And then seeing an educator can help you learn healthier lifestyle behaviors. You'll learn more about proper nutrition for your diabetes, um, how to incorporate physical activity in and the proper amount for you. And so these are all really important parts of just your lifestyle and, and behavior. Just and then a decrease in healthcare costs. So that's always good if you can have um, fewer hospital ad admissions and readmissions and have, have less costs for your um, diabetes. And then the very last thing here, which I think is really the most important part that I think is that enhanced self-efficacy. If you go in for a DSME visit and learn um, how to care better for your diabetes or, or get some more knowledge and information on specifically for you, how to manage your diabetes better. It's going to empower you to make those decisions um, that will um, make your life better and it will make your diabetes management a lot better. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this part of our presentation and I'm just gonna turn the time back over to Rebecca.
Thank you, Pam and Serene. Now, before we begin the cooking segment, I just want to remind everyone to continue to submit questions in the Q&A. I see we've already got a few, so thank you. Pam, Serene, and our chefs will answer some of the most popular questions after the segment. And don't forget to give a thumbs up in the Q&A for questions you like the most. Um, now, I know that some people worry about being able to cook meals that taste good or maybe that it's too hard or complicated. Uh, but the good news is that it doesn't have to be. Um, Catherine and Paige, the chefs uh, who are here with us tonight from University of Utah Extension are here to show us how to make three sisters salad to get you started. And we'll share the link to these recipes and others in the Q&A box and in the follow-up email that you'll receive after this event. So I would like to welcome Catherine and Paige. Uh, take it away. Thank you so much. We're so excited to be here and do this demo for you. We are both from Southeastern Utah. So we wanted to find something that would um, inspire our Native American cultures that we work with. So we decided to do a three sister salad. It's got corn, beans, and squash. And the reason that that's together is those plants thrive together when you put them together. This recipe is from Erin Clayston, who is a registered dietitian at Utah Navajo Health System. So we'll get started with that. All right, so as Paige said, it has the corn, the bean, and the squash. And in order to, you first start, as you look at the recipe, you'll see that you need to roast your squash. And so we've already got some uh, that we've roasted, but I wanted to demonstrate how you would cut up your squash. So you just get a nice little zucchini like this, cut off both ends, cut it in, in half, whoops. Make sure you hold on to it just like this so it doesn't get away from you and you don't cut yourself with a knife, that would be bad. And then you flip it over because that's more stable than the round side. Again, cut it again and slice it again. And if it's too long, you could just slice it in half first and then uh, this way, and then you could slice it this way. And then we're just going to cut it into, I'm just gonna dice it up. Okay, so now that that's done, Let's move it out of the way. And we do, like I say, we already have some squash that we've already diced and roasted. Um, I'm going to show you now how to cut an onion because at some point uh, in the recipe, you will be uh, using cooking an onion. So what I did with the onion is I just sliced off the end and then laid it up on its cut end and sliced it down this way in half. That gives you a nice stable surface. So you're gonna go ahead and remove this outer skin. And if you like to make vegetable broth, this is a great thing to save to roast for your vegetable broth. That's for another day. We're not talking about vegetable broth today. And then just take your, so put your fingers on either side of the onion, and then you're just going to make slices your onion. You can see they're about maybe a quarter, half inch thick. You just cut down through those and hold it together, flip it, and then slice down through it. And then you've got some real nice little diced onion right there. Um, now I want to show you how to, how you're going to mince your garlic. So here's your garlic clove. You see it has the paper. They do have some really nice uh, paper removers uh, that are, it's like a silicone tube and you just put your, your garlic in it and rub it back and forth and the, the uh, paper outer cover comes off. But for today, we're just going to show you how the professional cooks do it. So you just lay your garlic down, lay your knife down flat, make sure it's flat, and then you're just gonna pound it and you can see how it broke. And this, the reason they like this is it also helps release the garlic juices so you get an, a, a nice, good garlic flavor. Okay, now that it's, you've taken the wrapper off, just slightly slice this way. And when you're slicing small things with a knife, you hold on to the, the item that you're slicing with your, with your fingernail, fingernails, and then you bend your fingers fingers forward. That way the knife goes across your, your knuckles here and doesn't chop down on your fingers because you want to keep your fingers. That's an important thing. So you 
Now that we've done that, then we're just gonna do the same thing, slicing this other direction. Again, you can see my, my knuckles, my fingers are tucked underneath my knuckles so that the knife hits the knuckles first and doesn't cut my fingers, okay? And you've got a nice little dice on your garlic as well. All right, Paige is already uh, cooking the... Uh, sauteing the onion. And you wanna saute it until your onion turns translucent. And if you're using fresh corn, you don't need to add it to this step, but I use frozen. And so we wanted to add it here so that it would warm. So I have both the onion and the corn going in here. What I did first is I put a tablespoon of oil and I preheated my pan. Um, and then I added the onion once it was heated, cooked it for a few minutes, and then I added the corn after. So I'm just kind of waiting for my onion to go translucent, and then we can move on to the next step. But you want to just kind of cook this on medium, medium high heat. You don't want anything to burn. And again, you're just going to cook it until your onion turns translucent. So as you saw with Catherine, our onion was white. So I'm just looking to see until my onion turns a little brown and a little more translucent. So we're going to wait on that. And again, like I said, you can use any type of corn that you want to. It can be fresh corn, it can be frozen corn, or it can be canned. But we just decided to use frozen corn in this today. So while I'm doing this, if Catherine wants to add the squash to the bowl, and then she can add our beans to the bowl as well. And you can talk about how you did the beans. Okay, all right. So here's our roasted squash that we've already roasted. I'm just gonna go ahead and add this to the bowl here. And you essentially just want to roast your squash until it's uh, uh, tender. Um, so like this one, this one looks, this is my favorite look on your, on your roasted vegetables. You don't have to have it like that. It just, you just want to heat it through and tender. It can still be, have a little bit of crunch to it if that's the way you like it. You don't have to have a mushy squash. Uh, you can also substitute your, your zucchini and your summer squash. You could use, uh, your butternut, because this will take a little bit longer to cut and dice um, because it has this really hard outer skin. Um, so, but that is an option and it will take a little bit longer because it's more dense uh, squash. Uh, so it will take longer when you're roasting. All right, so I've added the squash to this and this is a can of beans and we chose to use Great Northern white beans. So this is a can of beans. Uh, I think it's a 15 ounce and it shows in the recipe what you need. And this has been drained and rinsed. So just add that to the squash. And then also while we finish up with the onions and the corn, I am going to show you how to de-stem uh, some kale because we're going to be adding kale. So sometimes you can get really lucky and uh, be able to just pull straight down to de-stem something. This is a little tougher to do right now. So I'm just going to pull the leaves off of the stem. And this, you, you don't wanna really eat that uh, just because it's going to be a little harder and it, it won't cook as quickly as your kale leaves will cook. All right, I think our onions are about done. And we will just get our feet off and add those to the bowl. So you can see they've gone kind of a little more clear in color. And so that's what we're looking for. So we'll add all that to the bowl. And then we're going to saute our kale. So I'm gonna turn my heat back on and add some oil. Add about a fourth a cup of water. Now we're gonna add our kale. And when you saute kale, you wanna wait for it to kind of go wilted and it's gonna start to go glossy. So you just kind of wanna keep that moving and just watch for it to go wilted and glossy. And I'm also gonna add our chili flakes while we're doing this and our garlic. 
You just want to put that all in there. Again, this is over medium to medium high heat. And you're just looking for your kale to kind of go wilted and glossy while you're sauteing. And again, this recipe is really, really good to use what's in season. Catherine talked about the beans and the different types of beans you could use and the different types of squash. Just use what you have in season. If it's summer, maybe you're using the squash that you have then. And if it's winter, you use what you can get then. And you can kind of see it's starting to wilt and go glossy there. My heat is a little bit high, so I'm going to turn it down. Smells really good too. <laughs> okay. Starting to get glossy. I maybe want it to wilt just a little bit more. And kale is a really good superfood for us. It's a really, really healthy food that gives us lots of benefits. And I feel like when I talk to people about kale, they don't really know how to use it a lot. So this is a great way that you can use up all the kale that you have, or if you want to try to get into kale. And kale is wonderful because it does hold up really well to cooking. Yeah, as you can see there, we've got it wilted. It's starting to get glossy. So we're going to add that to our bowl. And then to be a little fancy, we're going to add coriander, but we're going to bloom our coriander first to give it some good flavor. So I'm going to add two tablespoons of oil back to the pan. We're going to add some coriander. And the recipe does call for ground coriander, and this is coriander seed. So this will be a little bit different. It'll just so you can see that you can substitute uh, ground coriander for the, the seed also. So there's this, there's a lot of options with this recipe. So we're gonna do what we call toasting or blooming this. And we do this so that it has a better flavor. And again, you're just looking for some color change here and you wanna just keep it moving. And you do this for about 60 to 90 seconds until you see some good color change. And it's gonna add a better flavor for us when we toast it this way. So I kind of see a color. I'm gonna keep it going for just a little bit longer. Just make it nice and toasty and give it some good flavor in our salad here. And as we serve this salad, we're gonna show you it's on a bed of greens, but you can make some substitutions. You can use this in a wrap. You can use it by itself. Whatever you're looking for to do, this is pretty versatile. And it's really good at, um, keeping in the fridge and having leftovers. So as you can see there, we're just gonna add it. Oops, gotta be careful there. Okay. Okay, and the last thing that we're going to add to this, this is our honey, our, our um, apple cider vinegar and our salt. And then and we just mix that together in this little bowl and then we're gonna add this onto our salad. And then we're going to mix. Mix it all up. So that everything is blended together. It's nice and green and fresh. Oh, you can smell the vinegar, the apple cider vinegar. That smells so good with the with the garlic and the red pepper flakes. All right. And as Paige said, we just have a, a plate of greens that you can add this to. If you like to sure. plate it. You can use whatever greens you want. What's your preference? We just use an Italian blend here. And we want to make sure we get all that good color on there. Just in our bed here, you can use arugula, you can use romaine, whatever you prefer. So we'll do that and then we're gonna top it and add some crunch. All right, so then on top of this, we're just going to sprinkle some roasted pumpkin seeds, roasted shelled. You can see the 
And we're just gonna add that to it. And then we have, you have, there you have your salad. Enjoy. Thank you both so much. Caitlin, I'll let you take over with questions. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, and thank you, um, everyone who submitted questions. So um, let's start with the first one. Um, should I avoid sugar and use honey instead? What is the difference? Um, and I'm going to shoot this over to Pam. Well, that is a great question. We get that a lot. Um, some people think that just because honey sounds more natural, um, that it's going to be always a better substitute for sugar, uh, but not necessarily. They have pretty similar amounts of carbohydrate, teaspoon for teaspoon. Um, so still better to read that nutrition label. Thank you, Pam. Um, our next question is, what number does the A1C have to be to be considered pre-diabetic? And I'm gonna shoot this one to Serene. Hey, great. Um, I love that someone's asked this question because it's important to know what your lab results mean, right? So when you get your lab results back from the doctor, go in and find out what they are and learn what they mean on anything, but definitely this one. Um, remember we talked about A1C as the average of three months of our blood sugar levels. So um, that's what we're gonna go by. And uh, pre-diabetes is diagnosed at a 5.7 to 6.4. That is what the diagnosis for prediabetes would fall in. If it's below 5.7, you're in normal range. And if it's above 6.4, then they, um, it moves up into the diabetes range. Great, thank you, Serene. Um, and then next question, where do meat substitutes fit, like Beyond Burger or things like that? And I'm gonna pass this over to Pam again. too regularly because I have a son who is vegetarian and those would fall into that protein source. Um, there is a little, little bit of carbohydrate um, in say a Beyond Meat burger, um, but not enough that we would really worry about it too much. So we can go ahead and count that as our protein on the plate. Thank you, Pam. Um, it looks like our next question here is, why did you rinse the beans? So we'll throw this one over to Catherine and Paige. Essentially, you want to rinse the beans just because when they're canned, um, the, the uh, canning liquid, and you can save the canning liquid for other things, it works really well. In this particular salad, you just don't want the canning liquid in there. So you, so you drain them and then rinse them because a lot of times uh, they are processed with salt. And so that'll eliminate some of that extra salt. Okay, great. Thank you, Pam, Serene, Catherine, and Paige for answering those questions. And thank you to everyone um, for submitting questions and voting on them. And so um, that uh, closes our Q&A session. So back to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I will um, reshare our presentation here. All right. Okay, miss some next steps. Uh, if you come up with some other questions as we're wrapping up here, feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, if we have a chance to grab them, we can. Um, otherwise, we can follow up after this event in our follow-up email. But as some for some immediate next steps that you can take, uh, you can ask your provider for a referral to a local diabetes care and education specialist. We've got a couple of websites for you here that um, we can put in the chat. Maybe Manny, if you're able to do that, um, we'll definitely be sending them out in a follow-up email as well. But you can go to the Healthy Environments Active Living Program website for information on both pre-diabetes and diabetes. And you can visit the diabetes management page of that same website to find a diabetes self-management program near you. And in our final moments here, we just really want to say thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed tonight's event. Uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, you should receive a follow-up email. It will come from me. So that will be rwilson at comagine.org. Um, within two weeks, we'll get that put together for you. Uh, if you don't receive it, please check your junk mail or your spam folder in case it went there. 
The webinar recording of tonight's presentation will be posted on the Camogen Health YouTube channel. We'll include a link in the email. And once we end this webinar, a brief survey will launch on your screen. We would really appreciate your feedback on this event. It's very helpful in our planning of future events like these. Finally, I want to say thank you to Pam, Serene, Catherine, and Paige for a great presentation and cooking demonstration tonight. Thank you, everyone, and I hope to see you again. Our next event is January 11. Oh, I, the date we forgot to change. It will be 2021. We'll be moving on, or 2022. We'll be moving on from 2021. Um, but we hope to see you then. Have a nice holiday season. And thanks again for joining us, everyone. Good night.